Welcome to our spoiler-free preview of Once Upon a Line, Butterfly's Breath, from Pert and Fracas, who are collaborating with Lucky Duck Games, who we have a th thank you for sending us a prototype copy to check out. So be aware that this is a preview and not a review. Once Upon a Line is currently live on Kickstarter. Game is not complete, and what we were sent was a prototype copy that only includes a small portion of the final game. Everything we say tonight is based on this pre-production copy and may change with the final release. Also note, this is not a paid preview. We were sent a prototype, and that's it. So Once Upon a Line, Butterfly's Breath, which I'm just going to call Once Upon a Line going forward, is being designed by William Aubert and Dan Thauvenot. It's being published by in France by Perte and Fracas, with an English translation and localization being done by Lucky Duck Games. The Kickstarter for Once Upon a Line, along with multiple expansions, funded in under two hours and is still going strong. The base pledge, which includes the core game, one expansion, and a metal scratcher, comes in at €39, Euro, or about $42 US. And the all-in pledge tops $100 US. Now, this unique game is listed as playing one to five players, with core scenarios taking three hours or more. There's also a shorter half hour or so tutorial and a one hour prologue. All we received were these introductory shorter games that we can't comment on how long a full scenario actually takes. takes. The game is listed as ages 14 plus, which seems about right, based on the content we saw in the bit we played through. Now in Once Upon a Line, you are a mystical being that takes control of one or more heroes in a post-apocalyptic future Earth. You walk these heroes through a scenario-based campaign where you items you collect, characters you've discovered, and skills you unlock carry over from one scenario to the next. Now, individual scenarios feature branching paths and multiple player decision points. Now, the truly unique thing about this game is how you play it. You explore this future Earth by scratching off squares on the scenario boards the way you scratch off a lottery ticket, looking for keywords that will allow you to draw cards and advance the story. It's unlike anything I've ever played before. And normally this would be the spot where we tell you to go watch an unboxing video, but we're not doing that here because what we received was clearly stated to be prototype components that would not reflect the final product. Now in our prototype copy, we got three player trays, playing pieces for three heroes, two playable tutorial boards, one playable prologue board, and a bunch of other unplayable boards, a scratch-off tool, and the instructions. Now, the quality of what we got was a bit of a mixed bag. The player trays worked well. They were well-designed. The playing pieces used to plan out your moves were great. The tray for holding cards wasn't the best, and one of our tutorial boards had some kind of production issue where it was almost impossible to scratch off. And in the end, our scratching tool, one end snapped off. Now, we didn't have the metal scratching uh, tool you get no. from the Kickstarter. No, we did not have that. It was just a plastic one. Now, the instruction books were mostly clear, uh, pretty good. They definitely had a translated from French feel, but translated by someone who English is their native language. It wasn't as bad as some other ones we've done in the past, and the rules did make sense. What was a little bit odd was the order the information was presented wasn't quite what you expected, and some of the wording was just a little strange. What I'm really hoping for in the production copy, though, something that was definitely missing is an index. Now, remember that all of these components are prototypes, and hopefully the problems we did find aren't issues in the final version of the game. Now, let's move on to how you play this rather bizarre game. So set up first, which involves taking a player board and seating it with straight line pieces in sizes one to five. So there's these straight line pieces that cover up one to five squares on the board. You're also going to place a blue zone marker in the tray that kind of divides where you put your pieces in your action areas, and you're going to have a spot to hold your hero card once you start playing. You then find the board, or what they call the grid of destiny, for the scenario you're about to start, and the cards that match that grid. You stick the cards in the provided card holder and flip the grid of destiny over. Here you will record your name, which is skipped for the tutorial, grab any indicating started cards, now for the tutorial, this is your first hero and their skill sheet. And do whatever it tells you to do on the bottom of the card. 
Mm-hmm. Now, for both scenarios we played, this involved scratching off a single line on the spelling of the grid, spelling out our first keyword. Now, keywords are indicated by having lines after the first and last letter. When you find one of those, including this first one you're going to reveal, you then go through the cards and find the matching card. You're then going to draw that, flip it over and read it and follow instructions there. Now, these cards are going to contain other keywords that you're then going to go search for on your grid of destiny. After the start of the scenario word is found, any future scratching requires you to use up actions. Each hero can take up to four actions before needing to rest. To take an action, you move pieces from the top of your tray onto where you're going to scratch and then place them into one of the action spots to inspatch while scratching off the matching pattern on the grid of destiny. The basic shapes you start with are all straight lines of various lengths that can be combined for longer words, but you can unlock more interesting shapes like bends and crosses and etc. Now, the cards you've revealed are going to give you hints for where to look. If a word is or isn't connected to the word on the card, for example, or if it runs perpendicular to an an existing word and things like that. Now, some hints, though, are more subtle and are found in the story text instead of just being spelled out there in bold letters. For example, the story may mention that something is found near the rear of the shed. This could indicate that the word you're searching for is off the word shed and most likely off the letter D specifically because it's at the end of the shed. Now, without getting into details of exactly how to scratch things off and what you can and can't do, I will just say that you have to start off an existing word and you always have to scratch off the full shape you used for your action, even if you discovered you are headed in the wrong way or come to the end before you are finished scratching off the shape you defined. This is because in addition to letters that are part of words, you could also run into a variety of symbols, most of them bad, that can make your quest harder. Now, after taking four actions with a hero, you have to rest. You also have the option at any time to rest earlier if you want to get a specific piece back because it's used up once you use it. So you really need that five, for example, you might rest early. Now, when this happens, you scratch off a square on what's called the line of tragedy which is at the top of your board of destiny. This is a timer for the game, and it's going to apply penalties the more you scratch off. Now, most of these will have you swap one of your shapes, your action shapes, for a smaller version. So like the first spot might have you swap your five for a four length one. But some will also lock your action spot so you can take less moves going forward before having to rest. Now, some of the special symbols on the grid of destiny can also cause you to scratch off squares on the line of tragedy, as does moving, which we'll get to in a minute. Now, in addition to the story keywords, you can also discover power words on the grid. These let you level up your character by using letters in the power word to cross off matching letters on your character's talent card. If you manage to cross off an entire word, you get a new blue special action. This could be a new shape, a way to prevent a penalty, or more. Now, sometimes when you draw a card, you enter uh, what the game calls a challenge. Resolve a challenge, you're presented with a riddle, and you have to guess the right word to progress. Now, guessing wrong can cause you to gain dystopian points, which are bad things when you get to scoring, or advance the line of tragedy. You can also get up to two clues and may even start with some kind of hint, depending on what you did in the story leading up to that challenge. While revealing words, you will eventually encounter words of a different color. Words of different colors represent different physical locations in the story. After discovering a new color, you must travel in order to start revealing words of that color. Traveling requires you to mark off a square on the line of tragedy. Interestingly, once you've unlocked more heroes, different characters can be in different locations. Now, the game continues with you using your hero's actions to scratch off things on the board based on the clues you have, which will reveal new cards with more clues and progress more of the story until you get to the end. At that point, you'll gain any story rewards, record your progress, and calculate a final score. You get a set of default points based on the scenario difficulty, get bonus points for avoiding hazards while scratching, bonus points for not using clues during a challenge, and then lose points for collecting those evil dystopian points. Except during the tutorial, items you found, heroes you unlocked along with their talents carry over to the next scenario. 
The core game is currently listed as having six chapters after the prologue. Now, I'm always on the lookout for games to do something new. And you gotta admit, Once Upon a Line is doing something totally new. Well, I admit, I have seen single scratch-off things in games before, usually some kind of reward. And we had a whole game that was a battle game where you scratched off hit locations. It was a collectible card game. I've never seen a game where basically the core mechanic is scratching off a board, which is why I actually signed up to do this preview. Not only scratch off, but word find puzzle scratch off as well. Yeah, this isn't a case where you just scratch off all the board to figure out what your reward is, which is, I think, where the real treasure here is, the real uniqueness. Now, what I didn't expect is that we'd only get to check out a very small portion of the game. Due to the fact all we got was two copies of the tutorial and the ability to play a single version of the prelude makes it a little hard to judge the game at this point overall. Now, we've all played what was available to us so far, and while it's interesting, it's hard to really judge how well it will hold up over longer plays. Yeah. Now, added to this is the fact that tutorial, while great at teaching you how to play the game, and specifically how to scratch the grid of destiny, does a terrible job of showcasing the actual fun of this game. If I had just played the tutorial, this would have been a much shorter review. Uh, the game really didn't start to show its charm until we actually sat down as a team and played through the prologue. It's only then that the actual neatness and cleverness of the system actually started to show. I completely agree here. I was pretty much done after the tutorial. As more than introductory, it was almost juvenile. It just didn't sell the game at all while it was induce introducing the concepts and mechanics. Yeah, I would recommend if anyone does pick this off, one player do the tutorial and then just walk the other players how to do it after the fact. I don't recommend making players play through it just to learn the basics. Now, I got to say, this game definitely does stick out as unique once playing it. Like, yeah, the theme's interesting, but it works. It feels very different from every other game I've ever played, and I've played a lot of games. If I had to compare it to other games in my collection that I enjoy, I would rank this closest to puzzle games and escape room in the box style games. Though in this case, every single puzzle is word based, including all kinds of puns and palindromes and uh, a, a literal term, a, a literary term I didn't even recognize that's in this game with what the snaking cow paths or something. This to me scratches off the same itch as those games as you're using, you know, logic and deduction and, and reading things into stories to figure out where to scratch next. Yeah, indeed. As far as board games, it really doesn't have any equivalent I'm familiar with, but there's definitely a feel of both word search and crossword puzzle to it on top of the logic problems. Mm -hmm. Now, what impressed me the most about this is when it clicked in that the story was giving us more hints than we thought. It's very obvious the words to find, the main words, because they're in bold and they're underlined and stuff. And and Sean was reading them out in a rather amusing voice whenever they show up <laughs> underlined, right? But then we had this, oh, there it is. That's what makes this game tick moment that made me swap from not being all that interested in the game and just finding the words on cards to becoming more invested in what we are doing and having a better time. Exactly. In the tutorial, you're just looking for words based on letter possibilities. Oh, I have a word that needs a Q and there's two possible places it could be. Which one yeah. am I going to go to? Where in the actual game, there's so much more nuance to the hints in the text. Mm -hmm. You're going back, rereading things to see if you can narrow down which of a couple of potential locations that word might be in. Yeah, and I definitely had a thing where when I played the tutorial, the game was feeling pretty random because there was two or three spots. And I'm like, well, I guess I guess on one. Whereas pretty much, I'm, I'm sure probably all of them, but it felt like almost everything in the prologue, there was a logical reason to search where it ended up being. I don't think there was that much randomness. It may have been there were none because we didn't catch every single little subtle clue. Now, one thing that did come up playing that I don't think I've ever said about any board game before is this game is messy. While playing, you're going to be doing a lot of scratching off of cards and boards that leaves little rolled up bits of silvery material all over your playing surface. You're going to want to be sure to play this somewhere that you can easily clean up this type of mess. And be very careful not to sneeze while playing. A uh, mistake I made while playing through the tutorial. Um, yeah. Carpet. 
is not your friend with this game. And I expect if you have cats that are allowed mm. up on the table, you might also be in some trouble. Yeah, I don't know how pet friendly the scrapings are either. We did find out they're silicon based, so they should latex. be all right. Yeah, it's, latex, it's, it's a latex, latex paint, basically. Yeah, latex paint. Now, another issue with this game that I can see is it's I, I would say it's not replayable. Now, the Kickstarter list recharge packs is being available. They're there as an add on item. But as far as I can tell, it's not like the word get grids are, are going to change. They're going to be the same. And just because of the nature of this game, I think it's going to take a long time to forget where things are to make something truly replayable. Yeah, for me, the only value in recharge would be resale or regifting. Yeah. And imagine trying to redo a crossword puzzle you've already solved, but just erased all the letters in. Yeah, it just it wouldn't work. And you'd read the clues and be like, oh, yeah, this is the one where this is attached. To oh, the shed. It's in the back of the shed. That's right. It was off the D. Like, you're going to remember those things. Now, what I did like is some of the other non-scratch mechanics in this game. I like the action system. It led to some really interesting decisions. And I like the travel mechanic. It uh, seemed a little weird where you just scratch up a thing and switch the color of your board. And all you're doing is scratching different colored colored um, uh, types of words. But you know what? With two players in the prologue, where we had found a fissure while we were doing something else... And then we decided to split the party with someone scratching off off Fisher while someone else went into the red area, is all I'll say. Um, I, I wouldn't have thought scratching off different colored words in a, a crossword or whatever word find would impart that feel. But it felt like we split the party and we're each doing our own thing. Like it felt like Sean and I were from apart from each other. Like I, that's impressive. Like, like the, I don't know. We talk about immersion in games that gave me a level of immersion I totally didn't expect. Though we did notice that due to shared inventory, yes. while there was a mechanism for splitting the party, anyone could use items regardless of which location they were in. Now, speaking of that immersion, that's what broke it a bit. But just I, I was just shocked that like you're you're scratching off green words, I'm scratching off red, and it didn't feel like that's it. We're scratching off different colors. Now, interestingly, this interaction while playing two players was way more fun than I expected. I, I should say three. Deanna was still there, but Deanna was just kind of helping out and taking some pictures. Um, up until that point, I was thinking this is a solo game, especially after the tutorials. I'm like, why would you want to play this multiplayer? You're just going to argue over where you scratch off. No, no, scratch off over there. It wasn't until all three of us were playing and we were working together, bouncing ideas off of each other, um, reading out the cards, passing the cards to different people to see if they noticed something you missed. That's when the game it clicked in how good Once Upon a Line is as a multiplayer experience. And I can only guess that the actual chapters of the game are going to make this more of a thing. It's much like escape rooms in that way, where you're bringing a wider brain trust to bear on the problem. Mm -hmm. Different people noticing different things about the clues or le letters on the grid layout and where things may go. Uh, you know, if you've got that one person who's really quick at, you know, being able to spatially place words on a on a blank grid, that's a major bonus. While someone mm -hmm. else may be better at uh, deciphering the clues within the text. Also help someone who's really good at riddles, <laughs> which I am not. So overall, while we didn't get to experience nearly as much of Once Upon a Line as I had hoped, I ended up having fun with the game, though it took a bit to get there. Overall, it was more fun than I thought it would be even when first hearing about it. I ch wanted to check this out because it was something new, not because I actually thought I'd like it, which is possibly not the best reason to check out a game, but I wanted to know what was going on. I was surprised to learn just how well the scratch off word find mechanic worked and how rewarding it would be to figure out parts of the puzzle, especially when you did it through something in the story and not just using deduction because there's only one Y or whatever. While we did run into some component issues, what we were playing was a prototype, and I can only hope those are fixed in the production version. Indeed, when it worked, it worked exactly as advertised and made for easy playing. Mm -hmm. If you dig story-driven games and word puzzles, I th think we just tried out the perfect game for you. Like, really, if you dig, like, which way style, you know, choose your own adventure books and word puzzles, you probably want to check this one out. I don't think any other game really matches those two as well as Once Upon a Line does. If you're a role player looking to get into character, this isn't your type of story game. 
you don't really get the feel that you're playing a character in Once Upon a no. Line at all. While they have a background and you can improve them, they are tools to make word finding parts of the game easier and more interesting. They specifically state that you're actually a, a higher being controlling these characters, not yep. playing as them. Which I guess you could get into role playing them, but no, you don't. I, I, the, the, the characters were actors in the story we were watching is more what it felt like. Now, you're also not going to dig this if you're looking for a fantasy dungeon crawler, dice chuck and beat them up. This is not that type of game. If you are looking for that type of game, check out our RPG in a box episode where we do talk about those. Now, the group of players who I do think will enjoy this games are the ones that like puzzles and figuring out clues. Fans of games like Chronicles of Crime and the various escape room in a box games like Exit and Unlock or Puzzling Pursuits, which we reviewed just a couple weeks ago. I think people are into that kind of game. The group deduction where Sean mentioned the group think is going to help are going to dig this. If you love scratch tickets, this could be a great board game for you. So do resist the urge to scratch the entire board. That will ruin the game. Now, I personally think my mother-in-law would love this game. Unfortunately, I don't have any way to show it to her to find out for sure. But this seems like the kind of thing that's right up her alley. As for me, I'm not completely sold. I did have fun playing what we played, but I wish we could have gotten to experience at least one full chapter of the game. Or even half of a chapter. I don't know how they do that. Based on how much better the prototype was than the tutorial, I think playing a full chapter could win me over. I still might pick it up. I'm thinking about it because even if just to play with my mother-in-law, because I really do think she'd dig it. Well, that's it for our preview of Once Upon a Line. If this sounds like your kind of game, head over to Kickstarter and give it a back. I also invite you to check out my written review on the blog where I get into a bit more detail and I do share some spoiler-free looks at what we were sent.